Bienvenue to Swagn to Reporters Plus here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. In this special edition, our reporters have been on the trail of dirty gold, an illicit business booming across Africa. We followed a trail that crisscrossed the continent. Mali is confirmed as the sorting house for dirty gold from various African sources. And in the Middle East, Dubai is its principal marketplace. Caught up in between is a whole story of exploitation and misery that brings new meaning to the old adage that says all that glitters isn't gold. Our report is by Caroline Dumay. There's a new gold rush in sub-Saharan Africa, a fever that draws all migrants. The number of illegal gold mines is soaring, and Mali is emerging as the biggest gold marketplace in the Sahel. The gold boom evades state control and attracts armed groups. We have Sudanese, we have Eritreans, you have, I don't know, Nigerians, Burkinabis, all nationalities come. Because for us in Islam, we say that everything in the subsoil belongs to everyone. Production that is impossible to quantify, but operates in the open air. These gold bars that arrive in Bamako come from all over sub-Saharan Africa. They are mixed and then melted in refineries, which operate discreetly under the roofs of a big market. The origin of the gold is impossible to trace, but most of these ingots will be sent to the United Arab Emirates. Dubai imports gold with a simple invoice a commercial invoice and you can enter Dubai. You declare and you pay $9, a flat fee at customs, and you're in Dubai. Where's the real scandal, here or there? Dubai has become the main destination for legal and illegal gold production on the African continent. UAE refineries launder the dirty gold from conflict zones from illegal mines in the Sahel to the skyscrapers of Dubai. Our investigation sheds light on how the global gold sector is changing. The investigation begins in South Africa, where the police hunt for illegal gold miners every day. Specialized elite units conduct regular raids on illegal informal mines. Yeah? Yeah, they are struggling. So there's no work. That's why they're doing this. It is an illegal but very popular job. Gold is the best way to finance criminal activities. Its price increases regularly. It can be transported and sold anywhere and is easily mixed. In South Africa, there is no such thing as petty trafficking. We have what we call Zama Zama. So Zama Zama is an illegal miner. It's a Zulu word basically meaning to try your luck or to make something out of nothing. Now, even approaching this, we are not naive. We do understand that the, whether it be Zama Zamas or whether it be the more higher level criminal enterprises that are involved in the illegal gold trade. It has to be seen in the context of global terrorism because naturally in different parts of the world, uh, both terror organizations as well as transnational groups are utilizing this as a way of funding whatever criminal ventures they have in mind. It's not, not any General Kadwa is the head of the Hawks, a branch of the South African police force that specializes in organized crime. 
South Africa is prioritizing gold trafficking as the country is not only a gold producer, but has become one of the continent's trafficking hubs. The general's force regularly intercepts large shipments. On December 31, 2020, a private plane from Madagascar landed in Johannesburg. While searching the luggage of passengers heading for Dubai, the customs officials discovered more than 73 kilograms of raw gold. The passengers showed South African authorities invoices from a company called Sky Gold, registered in Mali. Gold stock, worth the equivalent of 176,000 euros, was not declared. The suspects were immediately brought to justice. They are Malagasy. Authorities in Antananarivo requested their extradition and are demanding a return of the gold stock, as exporting gold was banned on the island in 2020. But first, they will have to prove that the gold was actually mined in Madagascar. Madagascar accepts a custom declaration document from Mali confirming the purchase of the gold. However, Madagascar asserts that only 3 kilograms and not 3 kilograms of gold was purchased from Mali. See paragraph 49. Skygold's officials passed through Bamako Airport a few months earlier, but it is difficult to know how many gold bars they actually brought back from Mali. The investigation file contains contradictory documents. A first form shows that the 73 kilograms have been declared. The gold was destined for Parpia, a Dubai-based company. But in the second document, which also bears a Malian custom stamp, Sky Gold declared only three kilograms of raw gold. In a world where false invoices are commonplace, the investigation by South African authorities continues. They're trying to understand why gold seized in South Africa passes through Mali, with Bamako as its destination. In the Malian capital, the head of customs whom we contacted couldn't meet us. So we went to the big market to the address on Sky Gold's invoice. But nobody there knew about this company, and their phone line was cut off. The company does exist. We found its registration certificate. It was founded in 2014 with a capital of 1 million CFA francs a modest sum to buy more than 2 billion CFA francs worth of gold. Skygold's address is in the Emery Dow building. It looks unused. All buildings like this one in the main market have a large number of small shops. One has to sneak upstairs to find counters selling and smelting gold. We managed to access one of them. Draman, who has been working here for more than 10 years, gives us a tour of the premises. When a customer comes here, this is the reception. We find small gold nuggets from all over the sub-region. This company buys according to the weight and quality of the gold. The carats at around 50 euros per gram is a small fortune in a country where the average salary rarely exceeds 100 euros per month. Every day it's like this, even on Sundays. There are about 100 people who come here, but they come from all over Mali. And then there are those who come from Ivory Coast, from Burkina. And then there's Guinea, too. We are assured that Mali's gold is the most valuable because it is generally of a higher quality than that of neighboring countries. There are 101 grams, 
There are 617 grams too. There are 200 and some like that. After the purchase, we prepare it for smelting. The Malian state has a monopoly on gold panning, but also on exports. Nothing can be done without the consent of the authorities. These smelters, located on the roofs of Bamako's large markets, mainly process small-scale gold, which today accounts for half of Mali's exports. Once mixed, the nuggets are smelted on makeshift stoves. No one will ever be able to determine the origin of the precious metal and where in the world it will be exported. Despite the political and military crisis in Mali, the gold trade is booming. In the last two years, gold prices have soared to historic highs. And it was not the war that limited production, but the coronavirus pandemic that slowed the movement of people and goods. Business has picked up. This smelter claims to produce between 80 and 100 kilos of gold nuggets every day. This translates into more than 5 million euros per day. In Bamako, it's often like this. People take advantage of the situation to extract gold and come to sell it. As I just said, because of the coronavirus, it has stalled a bit. Otherwise, we used to smelt even more than that. The melted bars are numbered according to their weight and purity of the gold they contain. After the smelting, we bring it here. He has to check it too. This counter claims to send shipments abroad through the Bamako airport every day. And where does this gold go, Draman? The gold, where does it go? Well, to Dubai. We get this to Dubai. Only in Dubai. Look at this too. It's not worth a kilo. This is 749 grams. A few years ago, African gold went to Switzerland or South Africa. But today it's heading for Dubai. Figures are difficult to verify as export statistics from African countries to Dubai don't add up to the UAE's import statistics from the continent. Mali, for example, declared that 500 kilograms of gold was exported to Dubai in 2019. But the United Arab Emirates claims to have imported more than 80 tons of gold from Bamako that same year. Sky Gold's gold bars, destined for Dubai, have a good chance of containing gold from Mali, legal or illegal. There are over 350 legal mining sites in Mali, but because of the war, illegal small-scale production has exploded. We obtained exclusive footage of the Intahaka mine, some 50 kilometers southwest of Gao. This is the largest gold panning site in northern Mali. For dozens of kilometers, picks and sieves raise thick clouds of dust. Working conditions in these mines are deplorable, with the sandy winds beating down on miners. As in the other small-scale mines in the Sahel, the workers represent many countries. Sudan, Nigeria, Liberia, Ghana, Burkina Faso, but also Libya and Syria. The exact population of this area is impossible to estimate, but it would exceed that of the town of Gao, which is home to more than 120,000 inhabitants. This remote area is beyond the control of the Malian government. 
The CSP consists of the armed movements that signed the Algiers Agreement, the coordination of Azawad movements. They provide the miners with security. But jihadist attacks can happen at any time. The miners explain that the population, which used to be attacked or pillaged regularly, now feels safe enough to work. This gold panning site is more than two or even three years old. The security seems to be assured, the people are stable, peaceful and safe. Everyone does their best. We earn according to how much we work, how hard we work, and what we have to work with. But all the people who work here earn at least two or even four centigrams of gold a day. I work for myself, I don't work for anyone else. The people who are employed here are paid according to the compromises made by the occupants of the site. Some miners have earned a lot of money because the middlemen they work with get regular prepaid orders for gold. Buyers come from everywhere, from the Emirates, but also more recently from Turkey and Russia. We met the leaders of the Azawad movement that control the Intahaka gold mine near Gao. The head of the delegation had just returned from a cross-country journey of more than 3,000 kilometers. He explained to us that for the people of the north, informal gold mining began as the result of the war and disillusionment with the governance of the Sahel states. The states, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, I don't know, OHADA, ECOWAS, UEMOA, they don't speak for these populations. They have experienced the rules of the game, recognized states, taxes, national budgets, voted each year, finance laws voted, but they have not seen the impact and the dividends. When you ask a local gold digger who manages to deflect all possible dangers and in the end, he manages to get out half a kilo of gold. And you have a Ukrainian, I don't know, it's, it's an example I give you, or a Sahelian or American who comes, whether he's a jihadist or a Jew or a Hezbollah or a Fatah or whatever. The Kremlin, if he brings cash from the country in CFA, he sells it. That's how they see it. You don't have to look any further. Securing the area is not easy. On December 6, 2021, seven fighters of the coordination of Azawad movements were murdered in Intahaka by members of the Islamic State. To increase security, members of the CSP say that they are planning to introduce a tax of around 5% on all earnings of more than 1 million CFA francs, or 1,500 euros per month. But this CSP representative does not know how much the jihadist groups are charging in the areas they control. What is possible is that the jihadist groups in the areas they control or in the shops where they have influence are charging taxes. And this is often annual. It's a Muslim practice where when you have at the end of the year a certain number of goods, there is a calculation that is made on the basis of your goods or you pay a percentage. And jihadists or others are not naive. They are people who are intelligent like all of us. Maybe each of us can have any judgment on why they do all this, but they also combine the political context and the economic needs of the people. They are adapting even in their way of being restrictive or imposing rules. They are sometimes measured because behind all this, there is an economy. Behind all that, there are dividends. Not for everyone, obviously, but the logic has developed.
Since 2016, armed groups have been taking over and profiting from gold mining sites in areas where the state is weak or absent in Mali, as well as in Niger and Burkina Faso. More than 5 billion euros are said to flow out of these three countries every year in the form of gold bars, a significant loss of revenue for the producer states. This gold rush also affects the security of their populations. Take a look at this map of Burkina Faso. In black, informal gold mining sites. In red, the establishment of jihadist groups over the last three years. The correlation is obvious. The anarchic exploitation of gold has spread to the whole region because the borders are so porous. Thousands of trails allow people to cross from one country to another. Many traffickers travel on motorbikes without ever being noticed. This way, the regional destabilization of the gold trade extends to countries farther south. We take you to Tangrela, a small Ivorian town on the Malian border. Skygold's gold could also be from Ivory Coast, the continent's seventh largest gold producer. In Tangrela, gold is an important source of income. This small town produces eight to 10 kilograms every week. Most of the mines are in the sub-prefecture of Pepara. We were able to access one of the few legal informal mines in the north of the country. These miners have organized themselves into a cooperative that extends over 25 hectares. The gold diggers come here from all over the region. As soon as gold is found in a hole, hundreds of young people flock here. They tell us that before the war, they worked in the fields with their parents, but activities in the villages have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. My name is Khalifa. I'm a gold digger. That's my job now. It's God who decides what we will find. We never know if we're going to win something when we go down into the hole. All day long, we dig. And sometimes we find a little something that we keep for ourselves, for our work. And we thank God. Gold panning is now part of the economy of these villages in Northern Ivory Coast. Everyone gets their share the members of the cooperative, the youth association, and the women's association. This retired soldier, who now manages the cooperative, says gold contributes to local development. The population profits from it. But if it was before in the underground, it's not that. We help the village. The cooperative has helped the Papara school. We have spent nearly 20 million to build a digital room and a canteen for the college. We built a school canteen for the primary school. We found sanitary equipment for the hospital. We even paid for a motorbike for the hospital to make short trips because before they didn't even have an ambulance. So that's a bit of a contribution. The managers of the cooperative are a bit worried about their security. They would like to employ only Ivorians to avoid infiltration by jihadists. But the mobility of the population in this region makes it impossible. So the mine is supervised by the Dozo. This brotherhood of traditional hunters supports the police in these remote villages in the north of the country. Everyone is searched upon entering and leaving the mine. Here, a Malian miner has just been intercepted. He is asked to show his papers. Oh. 
I'm going to go to the house. Alassane Sisse, is it? Did you take the camera with Adama Traore? Get your stuff and go. We have to identify him. He has to find us a safe relative to say, yes, he is with me, because he is Malian, to say that he is my guardian. If he doesn't have a guardian, the cooperative wants to take him to the brigade for questioning. The members of this cooperative explain that they also work with the leaders of the Malian and Burkinabe villages along the border, because the gold from Tangrela is likely to be sold outside of Ivory Coast. The sector's dynamics stem from the history of the region. In the north of the country, gold panning is linked to the Civil War and the occupation of these areas by the Force Nouvelle, the rebel movement that brought Alassane Ouattara to power in 2010. Gold was mined in the region during the war. This consultant, who has worked for many international organizations, says the current traffic is a continuation of the region's military history. At the time of the rebellion, at one point we had to feed, yes, they were soldiers, but not professional soldiers. They were people we recruited here and there who could lend a hand. At some point, they had to be fed. You had to pay for equipment. They had to survive. And they found the source of funding, which was artisanal gold mining. But they couldn't deal with the legal gold buying and selling offices that were in Abidjan, in the government part of the country. They had to turn to other sources of funding in neighboring countries, such as Mali and Burkina, which have a long history of gold panning. So there were well-oiled systems in place with buyers. Historical factors alone do not explain why Bamako has emerged as the Sahelian hub of gold. At 3%, export taxes are also much lower than in neighboring countries and only applied to the first 50 kilograms of gold. But not always. Look at the Sky Gold invoice. It clearly shows that those who transported the gold only paid 5,000 CFA francs, less than 10 euros for the entire shipment. The situation does not please all role players in Bamako. The president of Kanku Musa Refinery, one of the two refineries in the Malian capital, is concerned. This Swiss-Italian businessman has not been able to succeed in his enterprise despite being in the country for more than 20 years. In 2014, he invested more than 6 million euros in this plant, which allows the smelting of pure gold bars. He was hoping to take over most of Mali's gold production as well as some of the production of neighboring countries. On the one hand, we're very discouraged. I'll tell you the truth. At the refinery, we don't reach 10% of our capacity. <laughs> While the smelters in the big market are operating at full capacity, this refinery does not get enough raw material for its brand new facilities. This company, who exports to Switzerland and the United States, is of no interest to gold miners. No one wants to deal with the complex regulations of Western countries. Business is much easier in Dubai. Here, this is 30.29 grams. We asked Dario if he knew about the Sky Gold Company and showed him a picture of the ingots. It's unrefined gold. It's gold that has different carrots. There's a gold component in it with a different percentage per bar. And there are also other precious metals. It contains silver, white silver, it contains platinum, in some cases it contains palladium. 
Dubai wants the gold in this form because Dubai refineries live and earn on other metals. They're free. Just imagine, 60 tonnes of unrefined gold per year in Dubai, that means between five and six tonnes of free silver per year. Now that's a saving. Free. Param. That's an economy. OK. <laughs> to find out where Skygold's gold comes from, Dario advises us to talk to his lab assistant. He explains that one could formulate a theory about the molten bar's origin by identifying the metals in the gold. But this is a complex exercise, as it would require a database of geological components of all the mines in the world. This refinery regularly separates precious metals from raw gold for customers. In Mali, they recover mostly silver. Mumuni deplores massive exports to Dubai. This is a loss of revenue for industries in African countries. We need to be aware of this phenomenon and create added value. Because when we manage to transform our raw materials here, customers who want gold will come and invest in infrastructures like this refinery. There can be many more refineries in Mali. This will create many more jobs for young people like me, people who don't have jobs. There are many things that come with it. The gross domestic product of the country will increase. But there's another project close to Dario's heart. He plans to build collection and service centers for small-scale miners to sell fully traceable gold. Fifteen such centers could have been in place by 2022, had the security situation allowed it. Our mission in the country is to achieve 100% traceable gold. But to the point of having the characteristics, the names and the surnames of the people who produced it. This idea is in line with recommendations by bodies like the OECD. By overseeing the supply chain, mining communities can develop and gold could stop financing conflict. The ideal differs starkly from what prevails in mining areas today. The 73 kilos you found in South Africa, it's a joke. In Switzerland in 2019, they took 24 tons from Dubai, where the origin is not declared. 24 tons, but it went back to Switzerland to go to the different LBMA refineries. 24 tons, not 73 kilos. I don't really like Dubai. If I want my refinery to have a good reputation, and if I want a future as a company with a good name, I have to avoid Dubai. Convenience is the reason Skygold's destination was Dubai. Here, it's perfectly legal to carry bullion in your luggage. And transporting gold in hand luggage has become one of the best methods of importing illegal gold into the UAE. Known as the City of Gold, this megacity has established itself as a hub for international gold trade in recent years. The authorities have made the yellow metal a pillar of its economy, but also of its tourism. The main gold souk is located in the historic district of Diria, a popular tourism hotspot. Here, you can find gold bars and jewelry in all shapes and colors. You can also easily sell your gold. Here, everything shimmers. Even saffron from Iran is served in golden containers. Sky Gold's gold was destined for Dubai's Parpia Company. It is situated right opposite the Gold Center building, so we went there. At the corner of a street in the less touristy Old Town, Parpia Gold is still in business. Its managers never responded to several queries. A year after the 73 kilo affair in January 2021, 
this company was implicated again for trafficking nearly 50 kilograms of gold exactly a year later, this time through the Comores. It bought the gold from another company registered in Mali called Mali Metal. The Malagasy smugglers were on their way to Dubai with invoices from Mali. Several suspects are actively sought by police. In 2018, the UAE imported 50 tons of gold from Africa. By 2020, the figure was 500 tons. In less than five years, the Emirates have increased their imports from the African continent tenfold. But customers who come to the gold souk to shop care little about where the gold comes from. The windows display Swiss ingots, and the salesmen explain that the gold is simply recycled in Dubai. The gold is cheaper, and that's why a lot of people in Dubai here. We have so many shops. The gold, yeah. Because the gold is cheaper. This is we make here. But the gold, it comes from, we import from the, the Switzerland, from South Africa, from UK. We import the pure gold, and then we manufacture here. More than 4,000 companies are working in Dubai's gold sector, and the tax system is beneficial, because here you pay neither corporate nor income tax. To become a commercial hub less reliant on oil, the United Arab Emirates has set up 45 free zones. The next station is DMCC. The DMCC, a business center for raw materials, was created in 2002 with 68 towers on 200 hectares. It is the largest free zone in the Emirates. The gold sector is one of its main activities. The DMCC has set up bodies to promote it, but also to regulate it. Clearly, there's a conflict of interest. Despite our efforts, neither officials from the DMCC nor the government would meet us. So we turn to a Swiss researcher who has been demonstrating that dirty gold from conflict zones has been laundered in Dubai for several years. His report was based on around 50 African states. Controls are extremely lax at Dubai airport. That is, if you arrive with your gold in hand luggage, you simply have to present a certificate of origin and an invoice. You don't even have to show the certificate of origin. You can just pay a fine. And the people in the gold market all tell me the same thing. There is no problem getting through customs. You can very easily falsify a certificate of origin. You just have to show your passport. Today, when you look at the countries where there are conflicts, whether it's the DRC, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Sudan, the gold from these countries always ends up in Dubai. The gold from these countries always ends up in Dubai. On the one hand, directly, on the other hand, indirectly. If you take gold from the DRC, it usually goes through Uganda or Rwanda, and then it ends up in Dubai. Similarly, for gold from northern Burkina Faso in conflict zones, it usually goes through Mali before being exported to Dubai. So yes, Dubai is really the washing machine for problematic African gold, too often from conflict zones. It is difficult to determine the exact number of refineries in Dubai. And once refined, the origin of the gold is impossible to trace. Refineries have a clear part in the supply chain. Some people said to us, no, but what are you going to investigate in the United Arab Emirates? It's just recycled gold anyway. And the problem with recycled gold is that it includes everything. It could be Nazi gold, it could be gold from a 200-year-old treasure, or it could be gold that was in the hands of a jihadist group's mine less than a week ago. Several reports point out the lack of measures to regulate gold trading in Dubai. A 2019 UN expert group report lamented that no smuggled gold has been seized. In 2020, the FATF, the Intergovernmental Body Against Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing, alerted Dubai to the risks of money laundering. In March 2022, the FATF placed the UAE on its gray list. In South Africa, the trial of the Malagasy smugglers continues. 
After a year, the Skygold company finally answered the charges. The Dubai-based company, Parpia, is desperate to have the gold it purchased returned. Madagascar's government would also like to keep the gold, but no one has been able to figure out where the bars came from. The story of customs fraud to the value of 3 million euros is only the tip of the iceberg. A drop in the ocean and an international trade worth billions of euros that keeps police forces around the world busy and which supports the livelihood of 40 million informal miners. Along with the smugglers who risk a few years in prison for each trip, the diggers are often the only ones apprehended in criminal circles. From South Africa to Mali, they are the first links to the traffic, but they will continue to feed the supply chain, satisfying the thirst for gold for five continents. Caroline Dumais and the team in Africa. We, of course, will be following that story very closely. Thanks for watching Reporters Plus. You can see it again, of course, on our website, france24.com. Stay with us.